Si vous pouvez couper vos micros aussi, peut euh, ben non, Sylvie, peut-être pas, mais tant qu'on ne parle pas, essayez de couper les micros. Wow. Hello and welcome today to um, the Montpellier Ecology and Evolution seminar series um, with uh, brought to us by Labex Semeb, with support of Labex Semeb. Um, today we have Anne Atlan from the University of Rennes. Um, she'll be introduced in a moment by uh, Sylvie Blangy. Just before we start, just to remind you, if you'd like to ask questions, please can you ask them at the, using the Q&A tab on the bottom right hand of your screen. Um, the seminar today is being recorded, so you'll be able to see it shortly on our um, YouTube channel. And also just to remind you that for the next two weeks, um, it's the school holidays, so there won't be any seminars. And we'll be, the next seminar will be on the 5th of March, and that'll be D Daniel Weinrich at 11.30. Okay. Thank you very much. Over to Sylvie. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Um, well, thank you to everyone for being here. I'm going to introduce Anne uh, very briefly um, before she gives her speech. Um, Anne, uh, Anne Atlan is currently a, a research director at the CNRS. She did her PhD uh, at the CEF in Montpellier in uh, evolutionary genetics. Then uh, she worked at the Paris 6 Jussieu University at the genetics lab and then to, she moved to the Eco Bio Ecology Lab. Uh, since uh, 2009 she's been uh, progressively integrating uh, sociology and philosophy of the environment into her work and um, um, she made the choice to join a social science lab named ESSO, Espace et Société in Rennes. And, and she works at the interface between ecology and sociology. Her field of interest uh, includes invasive species and beyond, the values of nature and the notion of natural heritage. She's also involved in uh, participatory research approaches. And she's presently doing her field work Lucky her at the Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, that's where she is today. So we met with Anne uh, at the last uh, Senere Summer School on participatory action research in MES uh, in 2019. And uh, since we, we've been uh, in touch. So please, Anne, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you for the CEF for inviting me. And it's very special since uh, it is a place where I did my, my PhD a long time ago. And uh, so now I will share my screen. Okay, and I told you about uh, my current work and propose you the concept of uh, invasive niche uh, as il illustrated by Gors. Uh, I'm uh, in Reunion Island, and that's a picture that you have in front of you of Reunion Island. And on the left side of the picture is Gorse, uh, Ajon, en français, the plant uh, um, from, on which I worked for four years. I will uh, tell you a quite long story uh, to introduce the concept and, and the way uh, we thought about it and the way we tested it. So Gorse, uh, Ajon, en, en français, uh, is an emblematic species, not only in Brittany, not only since 1916, but for almost the Middle Age and in a, a lot of countries of uh, Western France. So it is appreciated and protected sometimes when necessary, while in other parts of the world, it is a noxious uh, weed, a pest that has to be destroyed with fire or any kind of uh, mechanic, chemical or biological control. 
this situation is not uh, totally or usually it was it is even common uh, that is most of the time invasive species do not pose problem in their area of origin it is only when they are introduced to a new environment that problem arise and that the species become invasive and that was a, a long time question uh, why do some species become invasive when introduced into a new environment uh, before answering to that question, I will just try to specify what does it mean to be invasive. Uh, in contrast to what is sometimes claimed, uh, there is no clear definition. The definition involves through time and also depends on the context and on the stakeholder. From a, an initial idea of geographic expansion, uh, we move to uh, an importance of uh, negative impacts that may be either ecological or sociological. You have here some examples of definitions uh, for ecologies, the um, emphasis in, is made on a negative impact on biodiversity. For experts uh, or lawyers, it is also economics, health, ecosystem services, and the idea that the species has to be not only exotic but introduced by man is uh, important. So the question is, why do some species become invasive when introduced into a new environment? Let's see what response ecologists and evolutionaries. Uh, for them, it's because the species was introduced without its natural enemies. Uh, so the demographic equilibrium is broken. There is nothing to regulate the population. And as a consequence, the population increase, but also because um, less energy is put on defense, there increased competitive, uh, competitive ability and so on. Of that also some question of uh, invisibility of the environment, but for the species itself, the idea is that the ecological characteristics of the species are different. For sociologists, um, the question is not exactly the same. The question is, uh, why are some species considered considered as invasive when introduced into a new environment? And then the answers include the fear of the unknown, the absence of pre-existing usage and practices or um, control methods, uh, the fact that man is reduced to the role of a disruptive force in nature. If it, it's introduced by man, it's not good for the ecosystem. The sacralization of the dichotomy of the endemic diversity, which is a good one, and the exotic diversity, which does not deserve such interest. And uh, the fact that the scientific viewpoint dominates the debate, why for the population and the local users, uh, sometimes uh, the viewpoint is different. So anyhow, to summarize, the thing that uh, the, social, the sociological characteristics of the situation are different. Uh, of course, my point is that uh, the truth lies in between, or not in between, but include both. This is what I will show you on gorse, which is a spiny shrub, a fabacea, uh, with a lot of proteins. Perenia gives 20 years, exaploid with a very large uh, genetic diversity and a high potential of adaptation. Gorse was introduced all over the world during the colonization uh, by uh, Europeans during the 19th century. We will see later why. So it is present in almost all parts of the world that are old European colonies. And almost everywhere it is considered as invasive. So because it is also very difficult to eradicate, it is one of the world's worst invasive species, one of the 30 plants of that list in the list of the UICN. Uh, indeed, it can uh, expand in a very uncontrolled geographic expansion. That is a photograph you take in New Zealand, which is the most invaded country. All the yellow is, is a gorse, uh, beautiful, but, um, but uh, invasive. And uh, it can escape from hedges. The word escape is not from me. It's what you find in the literature. So that's, uh, it's not in flower, but it's gorse. And um, because, yes, I wanted to say ghost flower 10 months a year. So in most of photographs, it, it is it is the flower. This I'm not. So that's a hedge in Reunion Island. And when the field is not uh, maintained, uh, ghosts go to the, to the grassland, which is not uh, usable for breeders. And then you just have a big bush of, of ghosts. Um, so indeed, Gorse is different, the species is different, the characteristics are different in invaded countries and in the area of origin. In New Zealand, it's common to see gorse with four meters high or more, while it's never more than 1.52 meters in Europe. Uh, this is also the enormous gorse in La Reunion. We did a study with uh, my, one of my PhD students, and we cut 
what we thought to be a bosch to to make measure of uh, seed bank and we cut 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 and when we arrived close to to, to that point it, it uh, um, we realized that it was only one plant with 14 branches each of these branches being as big as one gorse in uh, in Brittany, in front in well in france in europe so indeed, there are some uh, differences that may result from the environment, but we have shown that there are uh, also uh, clearly genetics maintained in control condition. You see here, New Zealand seedlings are bigger than Scotland, where they come from, where well, the population come from, and reunion um, seedlings are, are larger. Uh, we made several and several measures on that kind. That was uh, the thesis of Benjamin Renoir. We compared Brittany, Scotland with uh, natural enemies and Reunion and New Zealand uh, with uh, no, almost no natural enemies. Uh, we made a lot of measures to test growth, reproduction, parasitism, and genetics. We found sometimes differences, sometimes no differences. Uh, we understood that indeed the, the, the species is more um, grow faster and, and it's more competitive there, but no clear evidence of a link with enemy release. We um, then decided to propose our own hypothesis, which is not linked with mean, but with correlation, uh, with the idea being that uh, where the weevil is present in the native range, the strategy to prevent um, predation uh, creates some genetic correlations that uh, uh, block constraints the adaptability of the species, while in the absence of uh, these enemies, so there is an increase in probability. So we, we tried as hard as we could. We found some explanation, but it was clear for us that uh, this was not enough. By doing that work, uh, we did a lot of field work in Europe, Reunion, New Zealand, and we make actors. And what I, I see there is that really for people, it was a hate, of course. But sometimes it told me it cannot be the same species when they saw how much we like it in Brittany. Uh, it was a plant enemy number one in New Zealand. And that vari variability of perception appeared to me uh, could not result only from ecological differences. So the first thing we do is go back to Reunion Island, which we know well, well, to speak French, which is easier when you want to make survey uh, on uh, social sciences, and uh, try to retrace the history of introduction. That was uh, the end of the thesis of Benjamin Audouin's postdoc, and the first uh, came of a sociologist in the, in the story, Catherine Darrow, and together we um, directed the thesis of Nathalie Hudeau. Um, we found first that in Europe there was a lot of various usages uh, from the Middle Ages to the mid of the 20th century for fodder because it is rich in protein, for hedges, you see a large hedge here in uh, South um, Brittany, uh, Grand Brittany, uh, fertilizer, animal bedding, etc. A lot of lot of usage which made like during the colonization time uh, agronomists encourage the use of gorse, and New Zealand even sometimes obliged people to plant gorse. Well, a few years later, they obliged people to remove gorse, but that was much more complicated. And uh, that's uh, what is explained here in uh, that uh, paper by an historian of New Zealand, gorse, a good servant, but a tyrannous master. Indeed, what happened is that uh, the technical uh, constraints were not um, introduced. The fodder must be made with dedicated machine, and that was written nowhere in the agronomist books. And also hedge and field brought by hedge have to be controlled, and that also was brought nowhere. It was known in the area of origin, but this knowledge were not transmitted. Um, so not transmitted, the way to mean, the way to control, or sometimes just not adapted because using gorse is uh, interesting, but it uh, asks a lot of work that is not compatible with uh, the open field of New Zealand, for example. So the invasiveness of gorse came for large world distribution, uh, exploitation to all European colony for agric agricultural purpose, and its fast expansion result from both increased growth and reproduction and the absence of know-how, so that there is a geographic expansion that is still ongoing. So we wonder how to predict growth expansion and invasion. This is what we knew um, 
after the, the previous studies, we had some points, some dates of introduction, but we wanted to go further and to have an exact distribution. To do so, well, we went to the databases, made personal observation in Reunion, New Zealand, but not only, personal communication from colleagues or friends, papers, flora, guides, and geolocated photographs. We had lots of points that you validated, suppress all the doublons, verify the source, the date, the location, the photos, and then uh, a sample to have a sampling homogenization of square of, uh, of five or 10 uh, kilometers square. This is a kind of photo you can find on the net and show you how it's possible to validate through photos. Uh, Gauss is very visible. It's flower, as I say, 10 months a year. So in most of photos, it is flowering. Why it's not, it is quite easily recognizable. And that also interesting because it uh, gives you idea of the kind of environment where Gauss grew. So we made what we think uh, is an extensive uh, distribution of course uh, two years ago when we did the study and um, with a focus on Reunion Island. As you can see, it is present uh, mainly uh, near, near, near the sea, sometime on altitude, and it is uh, uh, particularly present uh, in New Zealand and South Australia and Tasmania. Uh, in Reunion, it is present in high altitude in two places here, which is a protected area uh, classified in the UNESCO in heritage and here pasture meadows. This confirms what we already noticed that there is a strong relationship between altitude and latitude. Uh, Gauss grew at the sea level um, above uh, 40 degrees of latitude, uh, much higher in the tropics and up to 3,500 close to the equator in Peru. So with this data, we made, um, yeah, we, we made, we estimated the bioclimatic niche using a species distribution model with Biomod 2. We combined nine different models, tested several scenarios. All that is described of the paper of uh, Christina and Al. I think I gave the reference in the poster, but that's not the main topic of my, of my uh, talk today. Uh, so we had a good estimation of the, um, of the bioclimatic niche with good sensitivity and specificity. And that kind of bioclimatic niche may allow to predict risk or as the probability of uh, establishment of ghost population. What you can see here, everything is red, are places where the climatic conditions are suitable to ghost. Uh, of course, other variables have to be added for final prediction, but at a large scale, these bioclimatic variables are determinant and in areas where you know that the other variables are also appropriate, you think that the risk may be very high, that um, the probability that GOSH can establish if it is introduced. Um, so we identified several areas of risk, or some more, I think maybe here in South, uh, in South America. Um, um, except that, that is said by the specialists of GOS at uh, um, Gospel of New Zealand for quite a long time, uh, probably in, in here, New Zealand, and in the North, uh, South Australia and Tasmania, GOS filled its potential niche. But probably that in all other places, the niche are not filled and GOS continue to expand. So is the ecological niche sufficient to make prediction? Uh, even if we had the real ecological niche, that is bioclimatic niche, plus all the other physical and natural dimensions that you can imagine, uh, we could predict where uh, the area where, uh, that are suitable for the establishment of ghost population. But except from some extreme point of view, uh, establishment of a population does not mean the that it, it will become invasive. And in particular, there is a question of impact uh, both ecological and sociological impact, but also of the perception uh, of the population or, or on the public sphere, and that cannot be predicted only by ecological niche, uh, even if it is very uh, precise. Um, this is why I proposed the concept of um, invasive niche, which is uh, the sum of natural and social dimensions that lead a species to be considered as invasive in a given socio-ecosystem. 
Well, measuring the ecological niche is already not so easy because it has many dimensions, but even when you don't have all the dimensions, it is useful for understand and for predict. So I had the same idea for the social dimensions. Uh, again, we calibrate all our work in Reunion Island, which we know well, and that was the thesis of Nathalie Udo, and we try to understand how the status of a major invasive plant emerged in Reunion. Uh, her method was to use semi-structured interviews, participant observation, and to look at many archives, books, etc., which is easier in Reunion because it is a small island colonized uh, only since uh, 350 years ago. So it was possible to retrace the whole story, what she did. Um, that's an example of the outcome of her work, the number of documents in specialized literature, uh, depending on the year, and uh, that is what she called status. So the plant was first considered as useful, still a little bit, by agronomists and breeder. Then patriotic, that's very special. It was a Second World War uh, because the uh, reunion was abandoned at that time uh, by settlers, writers of geographs. Uh, landscaping because uh, of its uh, nice and long lasting flowering by botanists and choice guides as an agricultural weed by breeders, of course, and agronomists, and until recently by invasive, uh, by ecologists and land managers. If we put that in a, in a line timeline uh, and try to explain these different statues by local socio-ecological events, uh, useful status corresponds to local needs in the beginning of the settlements where it was uh, usual to make massive importation to solve local problems. Patriotic status correspond to the World War. Uh, landscaping status correspond where people began to go to nature for entertainment and contemplation. Noxious weed status with the agricultural development of uh, breeding in high altitude of the island and the invasive status with a protection endemic species by the ONF, the so creation of a national park and the classification at the UNESCO heritage. And I don't know you, but when I see uh, that uh, line, uh, it seems to me obvious that there will be something that will come later. But well, we don't know. At a more global scale, uh, what changes during that time is that we came from peasant agriculture to a productivist agriculture, to wild nature and their emotional register to the emergence of the concept of biodiversity and endangered biodiversity, and to the idea that there was an uh, inexhaustible natural resources to the rise uh, of ecology as a politics. So the invasive status is one of these stages. And uh, we were wondering what growth status was at the world scale. What explains the national public status and the intensity of the struggle against ghosts? So we used what we knew from Reunion Island, what were uh, the important uh, points to, to look at, and uh, um, transfer that to the countries where our staff made fieldwork to the INR Maris, uh, countries, all countries of South America, um, because it was a single continent with different situation, and then uh, added more countries. The methodology was the following, three search engine, two housing modes, uh, four cross uh, criteria or um, the name of the plant in Latin, English, local language, the name of the country in Latin, English, local language, where um, uh, Gorse was also the name uh, in um, speaking English country. We look at the 41st site, either at 21st sites and what uh, we, we looked at was the, nas the national level, the status given to the species, the local lists, the literature, the management strategies, and very generally speaking, the way um, the word used to the discourse around course, and similar thing at the international level. Doing that, <coughs> Nathalie was able to identify um, the same status that are in reunion with uh, uh, invasive, noxious, landscaping, useful with three types of, uh, of usages uh, that can be socioeconomic, environmental, or biomedical. 
And uh, as you can see, the invasive status is always present. Just a minute. Okay. So at a global scale, uh, there are always several status of growth, invasive being only one of them, and the status of useful plants uh, often appears, but the invasive status is always present. It's considered invasive in all countries out of Europe, including where it is absent. For example, in Japan, it is in the list of the invasive species of the country, and we weren't able to see one plant of growth, nowhere, even by asking by colleagues, botanists, etc. It seems to us that there's no growth in Japan, but it is maybe, uh, maybe in one garden, um, but, but that's all, in botanical garden, but it is considered as invasive. Um, also, where its potential for expansion is low, for example, in Sri Lanka, there are 10 populations in small places, which is in the national park, but it is considered as invasive. So since growth is considered invasive everywhere, uh, what variable do we have to use to measure its ecological niche? We built an indicator which is not the existence of the invasive status, but the importance of this invasive status in the public sphere. That uh, indicator was built by Nathalie Udo. At the level zero, no publicization. Level one, only in specialized literature by scientists and environmental managers. Level two, the same, plus an official national list of invasive species or public institution. Level three, gross management action. And level four, when it's mentioned also by amateurs and the general public. So that's five level indicator was a variable to be explained. Uh, we made that as rigorously as possible. I don't put that for you to read it, but uh, it's, it's in the paper. But uh, to see that we try really to be rigorous to do the same thing in all countries. Um, because that was easier than determine all the status, we added all the other countries were with attested presence of growth. So we made that for 21 countries. Okay. So then what are the explanatory variable? They had to be relevant, of course, but they also had to be accessible for all countries uh, through models or through the net. We used our previous work on the bioclimatic niche uh, to estimate the proportion of the country whose bioclimatic conditions are favorable to growth. Uh, we use a, a social distribution model with a maximum likelihood method and um, geolocalization data to estimate the proportion of the country whose climate is above the threshold. Latitude, latitude we use the mean latitude. Uh, it's a proxy of uh, the altitude occupied by growth, so it may be important then the proportion of natural protected areas in the country and the presence of growth in them, the proportion of permanent grassland in the country and the presence of growth in them, in agricultural areas, but we knew when they are in agricultural areas, it's in permanent grassland. And we wanted an estimate of social progress and we choose a social progress index because it is a multidimensional index that includes both social and environmental quality. You can find it uh, easily on the net if you want more details. So we transform that into variables. Some of them are quantitative, the proportion uh, of climatic condition, protected area, permanent grassland, or the social progress index. And uh, three others had uh, two or three modalities, presence or absence. Or, uh, for the latitude, we took a range because uh, there's not one latitude for a country, so we prefer to have uh, something like a tropical or uh, intertropical or no, not. Uh, so we performed the Hill and Smith analysis. This analysis is suitable when you mix both uh, qualitative and quantitative variables, and uh, it distributed the countries into um, two main axes. Okay, and then with that, we, uh, we, see, we, um, we put our variable uh, indicator of the publicization of the invasive status. And this is what we get. So as you see, there is a very clear gradient. 
Um, that was not really expected, I might say. I, I hope to find something, but not such a clear gradient. Um, we wonder if there was some kind of tautology in our variables, but a priori there is not, there, there's nothing in the, um, that, that really explains the, the, the status uh, here. So um, there is a clear variance that is how uh, this model uh, can predict very well the pace of the invasive state of, of growth in the public sphere. So what are these two axes? Um, in the first axis, you have, you see, uh, it's absence of growth in an uh, agricultural area, presence of growth in natural protected area, uh, climatic niche and um, social progress index, uh, which is uh, what we call the um, social geographic call axis. Um, why no growth uh, is agricultural area is important because when growth is present in agricultural areas, the status of agronomic pest uh, may overcome the, wild, the one of uh, invasive uh, species. The, the second axis uh, is very clearly structured by the presence of permanent grassland on one hand and the protected natural areas in the other hand. So it is clearly a variable of land use. Uh, permanent grassland, um, natural protected areas. And as you can see, the third axis uh, has a climatic niche, which is uh, orthogonal to the others, which is also a little present uh, here in the first axis, one of socio-geographic uh, variables, but it is mainly present on an axis which is totally orthogonal to the others, which does not mean that it has no importance. Uh, if you look uh, at the variable alone, it is the one that has um, the more weight here. And also we, we uh, only two countries where GOS is present. So uh, it play a role also in, in that part. This is what happens once GOS is, pre is present. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, it is present on a single axe that is orthogonal to the others. So when, um, we want to interpret that. Uh, it means that uh, if, you, if you want to predict where ghosts would be considered um, in the public sphere as an uh, invasive species, uh, you will have to look uh, partly at uh, where it can establish, but also a lot on the socio-geographical condition of the species and of uh, the land use, uh, which the importance of the land use can may, is uh, was predictable, but uh, the, the way that you can manage to put that in variable to have accurate prediction uh, is, I think, interesting. And we have some uh, uh, particular exceptions that may be explained uh, more more roughly uh, uh, by more detailed look, or by the third axis, for example, in Peru. Um, what uh, happens in Peru is that um, Gauss is got only present at very high altitude and probably just a small part of the country uh, goes to its bioclimatic niche. So uh, what determines publicization of ghosts as invasive uh, species? Uh, we have seen there are uh, social ecological factors, which are land use, agricultural model, the level of sensibility to biodiversity that is when directly estimated by the proportion of uh, natural protected areas or the social progress index. And all these cross with uh, um, more natural uh, variables, which is the overlap between the bioclimatic niche and areas of interest. It is when growth uh, is able to cross on farmland areas, then it will have the status of agricultural pest. And when growth uh, can, um, grow on areas that correspond to protected natural areas, then it will have the status of invasive species. Um, this status can coexist, they're not really mutually exclusive, but um, the status of invasive species is really uh, very strong when the other status are, are low. There is a particular case of the tropics. Because what happens is that in the tropics, Gauss bioclimatic niche recovers natural protected areas. Uh, why? Uh, because we have seen that in the tropics, Gauss grow at high altitude, 
altitude. And uh, these places at high altitude, it's a case in Reunion, it's a case in Hawaii, it's a case in Sri Lanka, it's a case in many uh, countries uh, of South uh, America, a uh, um, time where settlements or settlements by Europeans um, arrived later. Uh, when well, the settlements arrived, it was on the sea level, and the colonization of high altitude arise later and uh, the arrival of uh, modern agronomy at high altitude arrive later uh, which uh, um, results in the fact that there is low human activity uh, less um, less anthropicity of the middle and uh, often a very high level of endemicity and this are the places where national parks are, for example, and these are hotspots of biodiversity. And because they are hotspots of biodiversity, uh, of course, there is a need to protect them. Uh, so there's a fact that uh, uh, ghost is a danger for that endemic biodiversity, but it is also studied, it attracts international ecologists who will see ghost as a danger for that uh, uh, endemic biodiversity they came to study and uh, who will uh, uh, spread the, the status of invasive species. And that is probably one of the reasons why uh, the status of ghost as a, a major invasive species is so international. So that, that um, status of invasive niche, um, I defined it again as the sum of the natural and social dimensions that lead a species to be considered as invasive in a given socio-ecosystem. It may help to predict invisibility, it may help uh, for action, but it can uh, be declined, I think, in a more general, in a more general way, in the same way that ecological niche uh, was useful not only as a predictor but as an explanatory factor to understand the coexistence of species or not. Maybe we can move to something like the socio-ecological niche, which, as the ecological niche, does not have to to have all his dimensions fulfilled, but uh, that can uh, uh, give. Um, uh, and light the, the way to think of uh, prediction and coexistence. So it can be tested uh, to, with other species, but I think that concept can go beyond the concept of invasive species and uh, to other status, for example, uh, the emblematic niche where species will be considered as emblematic, uh, indigenized, or even predator, uh, where are cats, wolves or shark mainly considered as predators or mainly considered as uh, endangered biodiversity. Um, that kind of thing I may, uh, I'm studying actually, I, I hope I will I may be able to present one day my, my work on cats or girl go along, uh, where I can consider that as a weed or not, as a valuable with a economic value or not. Um, I think that way to, to mix natural and social dimension may be very powerful. Um, it is, can be a potential tool uh, for risk analysis to predict where there will be a risk. Uh, in the case of invasive species, uh, it is clear that ghosts will come somewhere, but where will, will it cause problems, uh, where it, it is good to uh, prepare, to invest, for example, for methods to prevent it to, to spread or to, well, that that I think you need that context, that uh, concept, and uh, also that way of uh, looking at um, a species not only on its natural expansion or impact, but also on the way it is uh, included in a whole uh, social ecosystem, um, implies to take into account not only the, the point of view of uh, scientists and ecologists in that case, uh, which uh, you remember in the beginning. Um, social science since it's, it's not, um, that's a real problem. To, to manage a country, I think it's a real problem. To manage a country uh, only with a scientist um, element. Um, the, the population has its word to say, even if they are not experts, but the way to manage that is, is quite difficult. That's why I, I would like to continue to work on. Um, so I think that kind of concept may be may help to do some participatory action research, but on the reverse, I would like to do some participatory action research to uh, improve the, the concept of uh, invasive niche or socio-ecological niche and to see uh, how to uh, use it uh, for, for environmental management. 
So I finished. I just uh, want to thank all those who participated to that study, our staff in uh, Rennes uh, and Bordeaux with ecologists and sociologists and students who had to manage to be both more or less, but they succeeded, and our technicians and engineers. Um, in Reunion Island, a lot of people for lots of institutions. I think I, uh, I didn't mention, but there was also Richard Hill and Hugo Le in New Zealand who helped us in, a lot in the beginning, uh, in Reunion and in France, all those who answered to our survey and all those who spoke to us just privately and were numerous. And uh, last but not least, the funding. So that work was supported by a NATIP CNRS for the first part, the ecological, evolutionary ecological part, the INR Maris, so that was uh, in this, in this interdisciplinaire, as an um, observatory of friends, the um, French Botanical Society, and the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme de Bretagne. And um, that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Anne, for a great talk, very uh, information rich, very interesting, I think. Uh, so there's already quite a few questions. Um, so we can start by the first one by uh, Olivier Ertz. So, Olivier, you, I turned on your microphone so you can ask your question. Where can I see the question myself? Uh, it's in the Q&R tab. Olivier, you, don't have, a, you have to turn on your microphone. Uh, now you, you're allowed to normally. Otherwise, what were you, your sources for geolocated photographs? That was the question. Uh, it's not me who did that. Um... I will tell you, <laughs> it's here. I will tell you, uh, the, um, uh, it's in the paper, I must say, first. Um, and the, um, now, so I need to share my screen. Okay, I can answer later on. It's yes, easy. that's fine. Uh, okay, Olivier, I know, uh, if Olivier can, yeah. All right, so there well, were you... Google Photos, Street Views, but and some of them who disappeared in between. And uh, uh, well, it, it's in it's in the paper. And if you want to ask me specifically the question, I, I can send you all, all the information. Okay, Olivier, or we look the detail in the paper. Thank you very much. Yes, sorry. Okay, <laughs> All right, so then uh, Roger Prodon had a question. Um, so you can now activate your microphone. Roger? Well, can you, can you read the... Otherwise, I, I can read. Yeah. Uh, yes, it, it is a typical perophyte, which means that uh, uh, it promotes fire, and it is promoted by fire because a fire uh, destroys the uh, broke the, the dormancy of the seeds. So um, fire was used as a as a control only in some cases, mainly in Tasmania and Australia, and only in agricultural areas, not in natural areas. Uh, so they, they burn the, the gorse and they um, uh, remove the, um, the roots and uh, also they use fire because uh, since it breaks the, the dormancy of the seeds, it can uh, remove the seed bank. All the seeds uh, germinate and uh, then the, the seed bank disappear. But it is, it is not so, um, it's not really used anymore. Uh, chemical chemical control also causes problems so it's physical and biological control depending on the countries okay uh, roger you're happy with the we can't get people to <coughs> to talk today okay um then sergio gonzalez uh, si. um you, you can Yes, Sergio, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, can you ask your question? Yes, hello. 
Yeah, so my question was, um, because sometimes it's uh, always like a point um, that is critiqued in many papers of uh, ecological niche, is um, which um, climate variables or, or layers did you use? And if you use different kinds and different scales to try to get a better model of the potential distribution? So we used a different uh, combination of variables, different scenarios. Actually, we used 14 of them. And then we chose uh, the one who had the better, fits the better IUC. Um, well, that's it. Uh, and we choose these variables um, by the fact that there are not too, too many, no, too, too much correlation between them and also using uh, our previous knowledge on growth. Uh, I don't think we tried um, different scales, but we tried one, uh, which we thought was the most, we, we tried two actually, but the, 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 we tried two with um, no, no big difference. There was five kilometers square and 10 kilometers square, and uh, there was no, not a lot of differences. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, now uh, Dominique Grofman has a question about the evolutionary uh, genetics. So can you ask your question, perhaps? Dominique? Yes, because I, I've yeah. lost you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, yes, and I was wondering about what is known of the uh, genetic evolutionary dynamics of course in enabling it to be a, a very successful invasive? Uh, yes, we did a lot of work on that. And it, it is an example that I told in the beginning uh, and a poly um, example that it was a mixture of two, two or three different genomes, one from Atlantic, one from Mediterranean. So it's very plastic, very diverse. Uh, there is a, such a high level of diversity that it's not easy to make the phylogeography. Um, but we, we, we use some techniques to, to see uh, what happens. And the genetic diversity to summarize is very high and is similar in the invasive and uh, native zone, which uh, reflects uh, uh, the fact that there are multiple introductions. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, so I'm going to play my um, panel chair. Um, I'm going to do panel chair a little bit because we have time for questions. I feel like the questions are centered a little bit too much on the, on or not talking enough about one side of your talk, a big part, which is the social part, which I think you're interested in. Uh, so I, personally, I thought this was really uh, in, 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 interesting that you're using uh, quantitative data on that. Um, one thing I didn't get because there, were lo there was lots of information. Um, when you use these predictors, uh, you use that to um, try and pro pro project the publicization status of invasive, mm -hmm. right? But did you also try to, um, to use this as a predictor for the actual presence which you use on the graphs? And, and also to, or perhaps you said, but I'm not sure. Uh, you know, when you use these maps, uh, can you try to, mm. to correlate the perception of invasiveness with the actual um, uh, Actually, the, there is no clear relationship when, when you look in present. The, the action of control of growth are not correlated to the abundance of growth in the country. Um, because if you, if you just look at abundance without adding where it is and what kind of land use, you have no correlation. And as I said, in Japan, there is no ghost, but it is considered as invasive. And uh, in, uh, in Chile and uh, Bolivia, there are a lot of ghosts, but it is mainly considered as useful. So contrarily to, to what even we expected, mm -hmm. I, I thought there would have been a higher correlation between the abundance and the feeling of being invaded. And uh, there, there is no. But you have a quantitative analysis of this because with your data you can easily do it perhaps see if there's a uh, no we cannot easily do it okay. uh, because we have 
well, we can qualitatively and in, in the feeling. What, what we can do is that bioclimatic niche, but knowing exactly the abundance, of course, um, in, in the map we provided, it's a kind of map of present absence. Each point is a yes. 10 square kilometer. Then the abundance within it, it's very difficult. So we did it in Reunion. We could do it in New Zealand, um, but you need- But the using map, the proportion map. of area covered or something like this. Yeah. Yes, and then you, you have to see that it, it, it plays a role, but um, in a way that is orthogonal to the others and does not explain such a high, uh, uh, part of the variance, but it does play a role, but that role is, is not determinant. Okay. And of course, we, we ha would have liked to estimate density of gauze, but uh, it's not possible with the methods we used. Okay, so... Um, um, then we can take a question from, from Clem. Uh, let me... So if you can turn on your microphone, Clem, and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering, you talked about uh, and showed pictures of uh, phenotypic differences between uh, New Zealand and La Réunion and the native growth in Europe. Do you know more about what causes these phenotypic differences? Um, no, we, we just uh, verified that these differences uh, were partly genetic, only partly. Um, Gauss is... Um, as I said, there's a high level of genetic uh, diversity. It's also a high level of phenotypic uh, plasticity adaptation. Uh, so we, we verified that, but we didn't uh, go further because that was not our main focus of interest and uh, no, nobody else did it uh, neither. It, it is difficult for an with an example species. Um, so we don't know the origin, we just can uh, try to understand the evolutionary forces behind that. And because as also I didn't tell you, but there's a very large phenotypic viability uh, in Europe already in the date of flowering, in the size, in the shape. Um, and this is why we, we think that uh, there are some constraints uh, uh, on that diversity in, uh, in Europe that disappeared in New Zealand and that allow expression of uh, different combination of phenotypes. Interesting, thank you. Sorry, okay. sorry. And, um, and yeah, uh, Lamine, what, uh, Lamine, can you ask a question or you can read it, but. Uh, yes, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, I was uh, asking myself whether you had been able to notice new uses of the plant, uh, new medicinal uses of the, the course uh, in the areas where it is invasive. Um, here in Réunion, there is no medicinal use. There was, one is Euro in Europe as a fleur de bac. Okay. Uh, it's um, against despair, I would say. Uh, we found uh, different ones in uh, many in South America. Uh, most of the time uh, it's for um, peaceful or calm or against stress. Okay, thank you. So, um, well, it's not uh, an additive question, but it's just a complimentary. Uh, uh, was uh, this use uh, replacing the traditional use of uh, local plants? Or was it a, a new use? Could you could you answer that? No, I can't. No, thank uh, you very much. Anyway, yeah. that, that would was doing it, but we had to go to places where we didn't go, which is mainly uh, South America, where we where we have seen this usage. Well, it's a great work. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I think. Uh, pardon. Uh, yes, I, I saw the question of Jean-Louis Martin. Yes, we or... can ask uh, Jean-Louis to... Because that's the to question, the two talk. next question are on perception and publicization, can you... yes. <coughs> yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I do. Thank you, Anne, for a very interesting, uh, inspiring talk. And yes, my question was, you mentioned the loss of use as one of the factors that promoted uh, invasive invasion or development, of course, in, in places where it was introduced. So I was wondering if... Uh, there have been places currently where they have promoted 
trying to promote uh, use of the of course instead or together with control or if that's a, an avenue which has not been explored at all by people well we try to introduce that id um the, the problem, well, we were very excited about the idea uh, in the beginning. Uh, the problem is that the uses as they were in Europe uh, since middle of the 20th century are used that uh, uh, ask a lot of man work. Um, I'm not sure that they are, they are appropriated to the current agriculture. That's one point. And the other point is that, uh, I don't know if you have seen in the legislation, it is forbidden to, to, to use to sell or to do anything with a plant qualified as invasive that for me is a problem so there is a technical problem because it has a lot of work or you have to adapt what was done before and there is a legislative problem is that you are not uh, it, it is forbidden to to buy to sell or even to exchange uh, plants so it, it's difficult uh, it's difficult it may be um, well, in South America, the use of hedges is still done, but not here. And um, that could have been a solution, mainly in agricultural work, in natural places. It is so hard to collect, so I don't think it's possible. Okay, so uh, now we can perhaps take the question by Julien, with, who hasn't asked a question yet. Um, there, was, there was Sergio with a perception, yes, and Julien, maybe the similar questions. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure because you know, I don't know if it's about perception or about actual. Yeah, you're uh, right. Yes. So you can um, tell us, Julien. You know? uh, yes, I um, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, uh, I was wondering. It, it it kind of is similar to the question that was just asked. Uh, I was wondering if you could foresee any future usages for course again. I don't know if, if it could be used in biofuels or something. But you started answering that with the manual labor problem, and uh, and also I was just uh, surprised to hear that the that uh, invasive species are are forbidden. Uh, it's forbidden to use them, which seems like a a big problem, like how are they supposed to to stop being invasive if if uh, if a newly usage is found or if uh, if something changes? As we've seen it change in the wrong direction, like from being non-invasive to becoming invasive. But how could a scenario where a plant becomes non-invasive again uh, take place in in this situation? Yeah, that's a big debate. Um, either you continue desperately to consider that any exotic species uh, is not at its place in that ecosystem and uh, you begin a struggle that uh, most of the time you will lost, um, or you accept a new species in a new ecosystem. Well, this is a little manichaean. Of course, you can also reduce uh, the expansion of a species and accept it in some places. But um, it is true, and, and I'm one of those who think that sometimes invasive species has to be accepted and not, and not struggle against, at least sometimes. And uh, this is uh, that point of view, I would say, helped by um, global change. And, uh, and if the temperature, the climate change, new species will, will come. But of course, also some species are destructive. The problem with the law of 2004 14. It was the first law on invasive species, so from that point of view, it was a good law. The problem is that, contrarily to what we recommend uh, as experts in the UCN debate, etc., they didn't mean several kind of invasive species. There's just one kind, and that kind, you are not allowed to do anything with it except uh, in uh, if you want to destroy it. So you can create an economic uh, economical rentability. It is done here a little bit in reunion with some herbs, but you, in, in France or in Europe, it's Europe, European uh, regulation. So I, I talked with the lawyers who told me, well, that's the beginning, the law is, will change. But the way law is actually now in Europe, um, well, and if, even if you, you look at the IUCN, they made um, um, a survey of um, valorization of invasive species. They always find it very dangerous. There is the idea that there is a risk as, that people will want to maintain them. From my point of view, they are maintained anyhow. So let's use them. But uh, yes, I think the, the law has to change and it will change because uh, there is not one, but several kinds of invasive species. And for some, 
some of them, the, the best thing to do is to use them. And some of them also are proven to, to be a beneficial for some kind of uh, endemic biodiversity also. But that's a big debate, even among ecologists, among ecologists and managers and population. And uh, we are not uh, helped by uh, the law. I don't know who made the law, but for me and for the people, it is not really appropriate. Sorry, just a, a small follow-up. Do you know who uh, who classifies uh, a species as being invasive? Is it is it the Department of Agriculture or Ecology in each uh, country or state? Or no, I think it's a, it's a consensus. Um, IUCN plays a big role in that. Um, each country had to well, they made the the, the reglement first and say, well, the country will decide afterward what species they will put on. And the country said, no, no, I don't want because I have valorized the species. This species has some economical value. So they were well, confident you will not put uh, bison or acacia or some of that. And the beginning there was only seven species where all Europe agrees to put in the list <laughs> because the country was so, too strong. So it, it's made at, at the country level and it's a group of experts that probably depends on the country and the IUCN is a lot uh, solicited to, to make that list. But the, the regulation is so strong that there are a few, few species on that list. There are several LODs, several uh, plants of marine organisms and uh, it's very narrow because once a uh, species on that list, you cannot do anything with it. Okay, we are running out Thank of you. time a bit, so uh, we can, you can take one last question. I'll, I'll let you choose. When you want. Uh, yes, I, I like the, well, the one or a calorie. Do you will find the answer on the paper? Okay, yes. Uh, um, so I, I'll just open and the Sergio's one of question. Yeah. yeah, the one of perception uh, publication. Uh, that's uh, the center of my topic. Yes, I think it has implication for conservation action of um, other endemic or endangered species because. Uh, the idea of a public status, well, you will begin to have an action once the status goes in the public sphere. If it is just a group of ecological experts who say, well, that small plant here is, is endangered, it, it's, it's, we have no effect. You, you need money, you need the support of the politics, you need the support of the population, which means you need to, the presence of the status in the public sphere. So understanding what makes that uh, status uh, important in the public sphere helps you. Uh, it's a two-dimensional process. It helps you to know how to convince your partners, but it also helps you as an ecologist to know what fight has to be done and what fight go against the global perception of the population. So if together you work with the, the sensibility of ecologists and uh, have in mind the perception uh, in the publicization, it's possible to, to be more efficient as on one hand and more in face with the will of the adhesion of the population, local population in the other hand. That's what I believe. Okay, so that's a nice word to finish the, the talk. So thanks again for the very stimulating talk. So um, Everyone, the, so as we said, the next two weeks we won't have a seminar and then we're coming back uh, uh, with Dan Juan Reich, I think. So we look for the announcements. Thanks again and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Nice weekend for you too.